So, so crime and punishment, the point of view. Let's, let's just take a few minutes here to set this aside in terms of all the other novels we know about because that's one of the things you should always notice when you pick up a new novel that you've never read and you should ask yourself, what is the author's tool that he's using or she's using to get you involved? So as you all know, there are many at this point many possible points of view. So Crime and Punishment is using the third person omniscient narrative. Now that's a very basic, very popular style in the 19th century. But in this case, and with Dostoevsky, he invents something new. So that's what we should also notice, and that is you have a third person. I'm going to read that first page in a second here. You have that third person who begins describing the novel just like you start in all those other novels that you know, Jane Austen, Dickens, and it's essentially third-person narrator. But then what Dostoevsky does, and he invents this, which will then become like the most popular way to write a novel in the 20th century, what he does is he allows his narrator to just walk inside of Raskolnikov. And so he's allowing his third-person narrator to do something that objectively you don't do, you just describe from the outside. But by the end of the 19th century, he and other writers want to do this, and so he's going to just walk right inside. Joseph Frank says he invented it, it's his style, and he's going to use it in all the great novels. So here is it, this is the beginning. At the beginning of July, during an extremely hot spell, Towards evening, a young man left the closet he rented from tenants in the Blurry Lane, walked out to the street, and slowly as if indecisively headed for Cay Bridge. He had safely avoided meeting his landlady. Now notice this is totally third-person narrator describing him. His closet was located just under the roof of a tall five-story house. It's for the landlady from whom he rented this closet with dinner and maid service. She lived one flight below. Every time he went out, he could not fail to pass by her kitchen door, which was always open. Each time he passed by, he felt some painful, cowardly sensation, which made him wince with shame. Now, up to this, up to the end of this first paragraph, there's no particular deviation from the third person narrator. Now, now the second paragraph, he's going to begin uh, plowing new ground, we could say. It was not that he was so cowardly and downtrodden, which you see already your narrator has knowledge of something that a narrator would not normally have. Even the contrary, but for some time he'd been in an irritable tense state. He was so immersed in himself, had isolated himself, it entirely given up attending to his daily affairs. As a matter of fact, he was not afraid of any landlady. You see, now he's, he's introducing you to the uh, debate going on in his head, see? Was he afraid of the landlady? Well, yes, because he doesn't want him to run to her. Well, he's not really afraid of her. So that the narrator lets you come in. Now, he's gonna do this through the whole book. He had, uh, uh, but to stop on the stairs, to listen to all sorts of nonsense, have to dodge all that, da, 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 oh no, better to steal cat-like down the stairs. This time, however, as he walked out to the street, even he was struck by his fear of meeting his creditor. Now our narrator just walks inside of his head and says, quotation marks, I want to attempt no such thing. What? What thing? What are you talking about? You're, you're confused. You're, what is this? There is the beginning of, of the trick, the brilliant trick of just letting you go inside. And that's what he's going to do for 500 pages. He's going to take you as deep into this mind and this person as he possibly could. Uh, so that's the point of view. Now let's just compare it to all those other possible ways that you can write a novel because we know that this is under construction, this new novel technique, it's 18th century, you're now in the 19th. Uh, and so if we go from the most personal, the most interior, number one is stream of consciousness. And if you want to go to your bookshelf and pull off James Joyce's Ulysses, you can see exactly what it is because it, it's, uh, it's you're inside and you're always inside. And that's something the 20th century created. So Dostoevsky is not going to go there yet. That's, that's not interesting. He's not interested in that. He wants to be outside there too. He wants to describe the alley. He wants to describe all these things. Uh, but when you get to Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, 
uh, other writers of the 20th century, there will be many who will construct, and in the Joyce case, the biggest of all, you're inside the whole way. You never get out. Now, one step back from that, where you create a structure of knowing what's going on inside somebody's mind because they're telling you, because they want to tell you, is the diary. So Robinson Crusoe and all the other diaries that you know about. Uh, or three, again, one more step back because now you're not writing to yourself, you're writing to somebody else. Best example for all of us here is The Sorrows of Young Werther because everybody here has read it. And so you, you remember what it is in our German class, and it's letters. And so the brilliant writer novelist creates this real person writing these real letters to you, you're reading them, and you're inside his head, but you're also outside because the frequency of the letters, the types of subjects, oh, where the letter comes from, where the letter goes, all these give you clues to the world outside. Number four, uh, subjective narration, where you have someone in the story tell the story. So you get the subjectivity of that person, but that person can tell you things from a detached point of view. Normally the detachment is a week or a month or a year later. Usually that's the detachment. So probably the most famous for all of us is Catcher in the Rye. What a great book, what a spectacular book. Now you move back one more step. Uh, great Expectations is a good example. Detached autobiography. You're, you, you've got a lot of distance and so you can tell the whole story and so you get this, uh, this wonderful uh, Great Expectations. My father's family name being Pirrip and my Christian name Philip my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. And so there that one is, that's, that's with a little bit of distance. A little, the distance comes, of course, from time passing. Uh, so there is the, uh, the detached biography. And then six, observer narrative. Great Gatsby is a good example. So there's somebody in the story, but they're not really important. They're just telling you the story. So Great Gatsby is the best example. Uh, and, but it's another step back from detached autobiography. And then next step back is the anonymous uh, narrator, third person a narrator. And of course, uh, a whole long list of great 18th century novels are like this. My favorite is Pride and Prejudice. Here we go. It is the truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. How could you start a novel better than that? I mean, that is everything that whole book is going to be about. And that's the tone. That's, that's how we keep going. Jane Austen is not interested in, in uh, Dostoevsky's stuff. She's not interested in... Uh, jumping into uh, David Copperfield or any of that, uh, it's, it's straight through. And there's a whole list of people up there who could be uh, cited. I brought with me Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. That's one of the best examples of third person uh, narrative that you're going to get. Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So that's, that's the third person. Now, you can, you can play with that, the third person narrator. So you can have a person inside uh, who occasionally gives a clue to who they are uh, but they're not really important. They're just, they're there, and what that gives the author is a way of saying something to you about the whole story. And a great example of that is Brothers Karamazov. Brothers Karamazov is brilliant third person narrator. So there you have it. So all of those possibilities. Now, what he's doing with this novel is he's using the very, very common third person narrator, and then he's inventing, he's elaborating, 
and he's allowing his narrator to just go right inside of uh, Raskolnikov, right inside. So a new kind of third person point of view. David's asking, did they come out serially? Yes. Uh, virtually every major novel is published that way in the 19th century. Uh, because and now, of course, it, it's then published complete at the end when it's all out and when it's been published, particularly if it's a success. So, in the case of Dickens, Dickens is is a smart guy who knows. Yes, you publish it twelve issues in a magazine, uh, but then when you're when you published it, you republish as the complete, and then you make a whole lot of new money because a lot of people go and buy the full book, even though they've read it. Yep, yep. It was a very prosperous very successful way for an author. And it, what it tells you is that the 19th century is a great age of magazines. These are all magazines publishing. These are monthlies. And these, all these monthlies are going to make it if they get one novel that, that people are crazy about. So if you find one novel in January, often it would run 12 months. And if you start a novel in January and people like it, you're set. Your, your circulation goes through the roof. Uh, in the case of Dickens, a successful one could send the circulation to like half a million. 